Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for tuning in. I am going to comment on a piece I read in the New Atlantis by Is uh, Tara Isabel Burton called Rational Magic. Uh, the piece res resonated with me because it's about things that I've been paying attention to for a while. And so uh, it's kind of in a nice little well-organized package in that article. And it touched a nerve, so I'm just going to comment on it and give you my thoughts about things within the article. It's not a critique or anything. I want to thank Ms. Burton and the New Atlantis for the piece. I thought it was quite interesting. Uh, and I think you will, too. If you've been watching my videos, you've probably heard me refer to these kinds of things. And so... This gives me an opportunity to go more into depth about why I'm interested in these things. And maybe you might want to look into them as well if you're not already. Okay, thanks. So uh, I hope you enjoy the video. It's a bit long, but um, there's I think there's a lot of good content in it. So maybe over a, a period of time, you can watch the whole thing. And I hope you like it and share it. Okay, thanks. Okay, so I'm going to start reading uh, parts of this article, Rational Magic from the New Atlantis, and it's written by Tara Isabella Burton. I want to thank again Tara Burton for writing this article because it um, really picked my interest. Uh, kind of push some buttons because I've been interested in these subjects, these domains, uh, individuals for quite some time, uh, some of them going back to around 2009 or even before and some more recently. Uh, you know, I was posting a lot of Rebel Wisdom stuff on my Facebook page and whatnot. Uh, Jim Rutt, um, things like that. And anyway, this kind of touched a lot of things here that are interesting to me, so I thought I'd share it with you guys. Okay, she opens up talking about this guy Vogel. It's a name she made up for somebody she met, or maybe a type of person. And uh, he's a fan of Nietzsche, human all too human, of course. And uh, he was very depressed and... Uh, all that kind of thing, feeling like he was missing something. So the owl of Minerva spreads its wings only with the falling of the dusk. So he has all these tattoos of Hugin and Munin, the Norse, North, uh, Norse mythical ravens who sit on Odin's shoulders. And, uh, <laughs> you know the type, right? cool people who kind of mix and match everything. Kind of like me in some ways. I wear my Thor's hammer and my little tree of life once in a while. <laughs> so Vogel's a part of a loose online subculture known as the post-rationalists. Also known by the jokey endonym this part of Twitter or teapot, T-P-O-T. There are groups of writers, thinkers, readers, and internet trolls alike who were once rationalists or members of adjacent communities like Effective Altruism Movement, but grew disillusioned. To them, rationality culture's technocratic focus on ameliorating the human condition through hyper-utilitarian goals, increasing the number of malaria nets in the developing world, say, or minimizing the existential risk posed by the development of unfriendly artificial intelligence had come at the expense of taking seriously the less quantifiable elements of a well-lived human life. So anybody who's seen a few of my videos probably knows that I kind of shy away from these monikers or copying identities. I'm a rationalist. I'm an NRX guy, reactionary. 
I'm a member of this team or that team because I'm curious about all kinds of things and I like to delve into them and see if there's value there rather than just judging them offhandedly. And also, if there's a lot of people that put a sincere effort into whatever their, you know, honest thoughts, beliefs are, I'm happy they're sharing it and I want to know uh, about it. <laughs> I want to know about them. So I don't like, you know, kind of saying, you know, I'm this kind of Buddhist or this kind of Christian or I'm a utilitarian or um, phenomenology is my thing, existential existentialism's my thing. I'm going to make a billion YouTube videos on Nietzsche or whatever, right? I'm going to do the um, uh, delving into... Um, Orthodox Christianity, like Jay Dyer, and wave my hands at my bookcases. Um, I'm a reader in at Oxford University or something. Well, I'm not. I'm kind of a gregarious um, uh, generalist who's interested in a lot of things. <laughs> I don't have any. I don't have a PhD. I'm not an academic, but I love to read. So anyway, I get into these things because I do have at the core of my being a desire to see human beings make it, to do wonderful good things, for more people on earth to thrive, for there to be less poverty, less misery, less suffering, uh, for people to learn and grow throughout their whole lifetimes, uh, to, <laughs> to be healthy, basically, to put... Uh, human health and the health of the environment, the ecosystem, to put life first uh, and, and healthy life and want to maintain it as something sacred and important, a core key aspect of, of the human experience, not just to make money and to have power and control and to, vic to be victorious and uh, all that kind of stuff, but to take it up a notch and see you know, how far we can go as a species. We're mammals. We're subject to everything all mammals are subject to, even though we're mammals who make things. And a lot of the things we make destroy our environment. Uh, I talk about this stuff all the time. I'm kind of obsessed with it, and I'm hopeful that we're going to figure it out. And if we don't, I really do believe we will go extinct. Our species will disappear sooner than later, which is tragic. So anyway, this touches a nerve because people are looking for meaning. I think this is mostly inspired by the internet and social media and Discord channels and uh, Reddits and WhatsApp and various things like that, being able to comment on blogs and whatnot. And it's all covered in this article in kind of a nice, well-organized way. doesn't cover everything I'm interested in, but a lot of it. So I'll continue. So communities like Effective Altruism Movement, which is a thing, you've probably heard about it from Sam Harris and other uh, intellectual influencers and whatnot. Uh, sub, so anyway, uh, he's a kind of a cool guy, and he had a vision of God being sacrificed on the altar of truth. It was kind of a psychological shock or a mystical experience. When I was a young kid, um, I think I, really young, but probably around 10, I guess, or 12, maybe 10, I was thinking, I remember I was in Ireland, I told the, the priest at the Catholic Church that I thought that uh, God created human beings because God needed a creator, because God was lonely. And uh, and so in a way, we created God or we create God. And, you know, he was a cool guy. He just said, well, that's very beautiful and creative. <laughs> he was like, wasn't shocked, didn't say I was a sinner or anything. Um, but I had that feeling that I can't possibly imagine God other than in a kind of Christmas time fatherly sense Uh even though I was an altar boy at church, I, you know, I, the liturgy and the sermons and whatnot, just kind of, you sit through them, you go through the motions, you go to confession because your aunt says that you have to, 
and you learn about mortal sins and whatnot. And, and you, you wind it around through your brain and read some things here and there and figure it out as you go along. But anyway, yeah, I thought uh, human beings, you know, we're here to add a human consciousness, conscience and consciousness to sorting out how the universe works. And part of that for a long time has been assigning agency to God and God's mythologies, myth mythical gods and whatnot. And, uh, you know, having a deep relationship with those ideas or beings or ent entities. Now we have egregores, stuff like that. But I think it's pretty social media driven, all of this kind of stuff. People still have meaning. Where I live, it seems like a fairly meaningful world. And there are real men here. We're not all testosterone lacking, you know incels running around emasculated by women i think that's kind of a anglo-western thing in certain cliques certain uh, communities online and whatnot and it's totally exaggerated so the people who are interested in all these things covered in this article they're a tiny 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 minority of the people on earth uh, i don't think indonesians pay much attention to this or people from Morocco, or other parts of the world, you know. And I don't really know how many of my friends in the States are up on all this stuff. You have to be kind of weird and on the internet a lot and reading a lot of things to get into this. And then you think, oh my God, it's so important because we're so smart. We can figure everything out. We can kind of combine and integrate all the things necessary to create a very enlightened and beautiful community that can fix things, that can steer and nudge the world in the right direction, people in the world in the right direction, and so on. So, really? Anyway, he moved to Seattle where he worked for a while as a janitor at University of Washington, where I went to school for a while. Um, he, stud he practices historical European martial arts, which is a thing that popped up you know, in the last 15 years on the web. It's kind of cool, you know, cane fighting and, uh, you know, gentleman sword play and, and uh, all these kind of martial arts, renaissance fairs and things like that. I used to go to those in California when I was in my 20s. They're a lot of fun. I'd still like to go to them. I still go to them here. Um, it's, it's, it's neat. But, you know, we're trying to head in more of a trad direction because the modern world is so messed up, despite what Steven Pinker says. Yeah, so we're heading in a more trad direction because life is so meaningless now for some reason. Well, it's complex. We know more. We have more information than we ever did. Less expertise in some ways. More abstract thought in other ways. Uh, we think differently because of the inputs, because of the flood of information that we're exposed to. And it's not easy to digest all of these complex domains of interest that we're, that we're surrounded by. Science, engineering, technology, st statistical thinking, probabilities, all this kind of stuff. Thinking fast and slow, like Kahneman talks about. Uh, we, we're learning more and more all the time, but it's hard for all of us to be up on everything. It's very taxing, requires a lot of calories, a lot of focus and energy and effort and time. And we don't want to spend our time on all this stuff. So we think differently and then we get confused because it's not a simple world. We live in a complex world now and we're exposed to a lot of things. So people are trying to weave together a new way of, you know, understanding the world's so John Vervecki is a big one in that, you know, space and whatnot, game B and all these kinds of things. So Vogel's enthusiasm for beauty, for poetry, for mythic references, for an esoteric strain of quasi occult religious thought called traditionalism, all of this his one-time compatriots in the rationality community might once upon a time have, has, have dismissed as New Age claptrap. 
But Vogel's personal journey from rationalism to post-rationalism is part of a wider intellectual shift. In hyper-STEM-focused Silicon Valley circles and beyond, toward a new openness to religious, the numinous, and the perilously woo. So I in the in the in the two thousands I was more of an atheist type. I I was interested in the new atheists for a while, because I had read Dawkins, and was familiar with uh, Hitchens and all these people. And when they started getting together and and doing things on the internet and the YouTube, uh, I followed them for a bit. And James Randi, obviously, things like that. Uh, podcasts were coming along, and those were interesting. So I got into the woo thing, everything's woo, and, you know, how, how to argue with Christian apologetics and Lane Craig and things like that, and thinking it was all very important that somebody win the fight, right? And later, bit by bit, I thought, no, that's too extreme. It's not that necessary for me to tell my religious friends that they're that they're mistaken or fooled or foolish or something because they have faith. And by the way, I still have a connection to mystery, to, uh, you know, I don't know how to define it, the spiritual goop or whatever, but, you know, a sense of feeling that's important to me. And, you know, it's just not that important for me to go around telling people what to believe. Um I do get frustrated when people tend to mix things that don't mix up well, like the um, But yeah, science is different from religion, and so we can keep them separate and still appreciate both of them for what they are and what they do for us. Moving on in the article, whether you call it spiritual hunger, reactionary atavism, or post-liberal et epistemology, more and more young, intellectually inclined, and politically heterodox thinkers and would-be thinkers hmm, are showing disillusionment with the contemporary faith in technocracy and personal autonomy. Would-be thinkers... Yeah, well, would, are you a would-be thinker, or do you think? You don't think like me, but you think. You think you think. You think, there, therefore, you are. Uh, you, you, don't, you can understand the utility of dualism without being a dualist. <laughs> Thank you, Rene Descartes. And, and still go on to Kant and whatever. Oh, I drop names. Aren't I special? We think. Autonomy, personal autonomy, wow. Yeah, it's a thing. So the, that intelligent people using the right epistemic tools can think better and save the world by doing so. In giving way to, in giving way not to pessimism exactly, but to a kind of techno apocalypticism. Apocalypticism, techno apocalypticism. That's a mouthful. Yeah, so you have the cool guy Schmachtenberger and and um and then get to uh what has to guide direct bind intelligence that it is in service of something that is actually both sustainable and desirable. So Let's talk about just artificial intelligence for a moment to give a couple examples because people have heard since – and and the reason it's up so much since artificial intelligence was um, kind of innovated in the 50s and some could argue precursors before that. Um, the reason it is in the conversation so much currently is the deployment of large language models publicly and where uh, starting with GPT-3 – and the speed of the deployment of those relative to any other technologies. Uh, GPT-3 getting 100 million users in, I forget exactly what it was now, six weeks or something, which was radically faster than TikTok's adoption curve, Facebook's, YouTube's, cell phones, anything, which were already radically faster than the adoption curve of oil or the plow or anything else. So um, uh, world-changingly powerful technologies at a 
speed of deployment, which then led to other companies deploying similar things, which led to people building companies on top of them, which leads to irretractability. And so the speed of what started to happen between the corporate races, the adoption curves and the dependencies is of course, understandably changed the conversation and brought it into the center of mainstream conversation where it had been only in the domain of people paying attention to artificial intelligence or the risks or promises associated previously. So when people talk about AI risk um, or AI promise, of which it has a lot of both, um, there's a few things about cognitive bias worth addressing here first, which is a topic you always address on why people come to misunderstand the superorganism and get kind of choice making uh, wrong, get sense making wrong. Thank you. you that, that, that means you actually have watched. Of course, I have watched and read your things. This is why we're friends <laughs> here. You're so damn busy that I'm like, hey, Daniel, watch this. And you're like, oh, I will. But you and I have not talked about cognitive biases, but you're right. I do talk about them a lot. So uh, carry on. So let's take there. There are clusters of cognitive biases that go together to define like default worldviews. And they're not a single cognitive bias. They're a, a kind of a bunch of them. And you don't even have to think of it as bias. It's just like, I mean, it's a strong sounding word, though it's true. It's a, it's a default basis for the um, sense making and meaning making on new information people are likely to do first. And so one of them that I think is really worth addressing when it comes to AI is a general orientation to techno optimism or techno pessimism which is a subset of a general orientation to the progress narrative. And I would argue, and we'll not spend too long on this, so it actually warrants a whole big discussion. Smart uh, nootropics and so on that make you smart. And you, you, you figure things out because you're so smart and suddenly everybody's on board, but it doesn't work that way. Uh, Daniel Schmachtenberger is a very special human being, <laughs> and he's he's wonderful. But you know, he, he's not going to catch on in a big way, and it, it's not easy for people around the world to think like Daniel or me or you. I don't think so, anyway. So they want to raise the sanity waterline, and here we're going to get into some other bloggers, uh, for example. Uh, this guy's interesting, Yudkowsky. The problem is that we do not get 50 years to try and try again and observe that we were wrong and come up with a different theory and realize that the entire thing is going to be like way more difficult than realized at the start. Because the first time you fail at aligning something much smarter than you are, you die. He was uh, interested in existential threats and whatnot, and especially from artificial intelligence. And he wrote a pretty interesting book, Harry Potter and the Methods of Rationality, that was fairly popular. Um, anyway, yeah, artificial intelligence, that's a thing. But, you know, if, if artificial intelligence messes us up, like social media might have or probably has, it's because of the way human beings wield it, use it, program it, and use it primarily for profit and control, power, propaganda, manufacturing, consent, and so on. So human beings, if they can't design AIs that can be controlled or used for good purposes to help people, to create better health, healthier environment, a better situation for life on Earth, then it's on us. You know, AI doesn't kill, people do. Guns don't kill, people do. Uh, yeah, you've got the AI there. You're going to use it wrong, so you get rid of the AI. Because it can do amazing things, but we can't be trusted with it because we're not wise. And we're going to fuck it up like we did with uh, social media and whatnot. And yet, it's been good for us in many, many ways. So what are you going to do? Slow things down, hopefully, and uh, implement AI in, in, a, in a better way somehow by figuring out what a better way is. And then we have to discuss this with one another across 
nation states, regardless of what, whether they're Ruskies or Celestials in China or neoliberal maniac players running around the world financializing everything or whether they're just dumbass consumers like puppets, slaves to fashion. We're going to have to get together and figure out who to trust on this thing. And it is a multipolar trap because everybody's going to want to use AI and they're going to develop it regardless. And big data is a thing and it's been a thing for a long time. And social media platforms know more about each one of us than we do about ourselves. And that's a fact of life now. The genies are out of the bottle and I don't know any genie wranglers. There is no savior coming down from on high that's going to put all those genies back in the bottle. These are things we have to learn to deal with as people. And one way or another, we will. We'll be dealing with it whether we're conscious of it or not. And we will eventually suffer what circumstances throws at us due to our lack of agency, interest, attention, or our fear of engaging, or our ideological beliefs or biases, uh, all the noise and so on and so forth, we're still going to have to deal with it one way or another. So we can, we can ignore it, but it's there. We're going to have to deal with it. So moving on in the article, overcoming bias was dedicated to figuring out all the ways in which human beings have gotten very good at lying to ourselves, whether through fear of the unknown or a desire for self-aggrandizement or just plain being really bad at math, as well as all the ways in which we might train ourselves to think better. I say this all the time because I'm, I can't do the math. Most of us can't do the math or the physics. We can't read a science paper, but we think we can because we heard a podcast or somebody on Rumble or Rockfin say something, and then we parrot it back thinking we're experts. And we're not. We can't do the math. Admit it. But you can do a lot of other things, and if you wanted to learn how to do the math, you certainly could. So by 2009, Yudkowsky had decamped to his own blog, Less Wrong, which I'm a huge fan of and have been reading for a long time. <clears throat> uh, I think it's interesting. It's, uh, but, you know, all of these things can be taken too far which uh, purport, purported to help people be, well, just that, by hacking into our primordial predator, avoiding monkey brains, and helping them to run new neurological software optimized for life in a complicated modern world. You know, the language is so goofy. But you have to be cool, you know. If, if you are uh, Jamie Wheel, or if you're Daniel Schmachtenberger, or someone. You have your consulting deck. You have to make up your own, uh, you know, language so that you can be cool, <laughs> Re rephrase things. So it's not just education and community and trusting in our educators. Um, but it's, uh, it's new software. So in our meat space, we have to program our neurological software. Well, that's just learning, education. And, of course, that requires culture, trust, companionship, friendship, uh, leadership, pedagogy, uh, good, good materials, and so on. And then we have to agree on what, what the neurological software is for. And are we looking at it from a sociological, anthropological, psychological, neurological, uh, soci whatever? perspective, or are we kind of integrating them uh, all together so we can get a better picture of how the nervous system interfaces with society and culture and whatnot, <laughs> the microbiome and the vagus nerve and, you know, pituitary, whatever, you know what I'm talking about. I, I, I just go, it's a complicated world. We need to be a little bit brighter and more aware of stuff if we're going to have agency and we're, if we're going to 
push our leaders and have some kind of form of democracy. Otherwise, we just have to acquiesce to the oracle and do what we're told and let the rules come down from on high. Curtis Yarvin's benevolent king and tell us what to do because he has our best interests at heart. I'm your father. Don't you know I love you? I only have your best interests at heart. Thank you, Jordan Peterson, my dear weepy friend. Anyhow, both Less Wrong and the similarly focused Slate Star Codex, founded in 2013 by a Bay Area psychiatrist run, writing under the pen name Scott Alexander, attracted not just passive readers but enthusiastic commenta- commenters who were drawn to the promise of individual self-improvement as well as the potential to discuss philosophy, science, and technology with people as uncompromisingly devoted to the truth as they believe they were. So we're all truth seekers, right? And uh, it's not garbage in, garbage out for you and me. It's all, you know, the truth. And the, the, the interwebs and social media is great for that because people go on on the tube from uh, Ben Shapiro to, uh, I mean, you can see Feynman videos, you know? Uh, So you can choose Ben Shapiro or or Feynman. (laughs) Whoa, which one's better, I wonder. Special stories that have been made up about our relationship to the universe at large because They seem to be too local, too provincial. The earth, he came to the earth. One of the aspects of God came to the earth, mind you. And look at what's out there. How can he, it isn't in proportion. And also another thing has to do with the question of how do you find out if something's true? And if you have all these theories of, of the different religions, have all different theories about the thing, and they, they uh, Feynman tells you a whole bunch of interesting stuff. And Ben tells you that he's just smarter than everybody else and knows the truth and you should listen to him. And so you do. And isn't it great? And people who are very intellectual, very, very inspired and intelligent and eloquent, uh, read these blogs and learn from them and comment on them. And it's a pretty high bar if you're going to read that. I, I certainly like it, but, you know, it's not going to be something that everyone in Shibuya, Japan, is going to be reading on a everyday basis. I don't even know if they have people, you know, at Fudan University parsing these blogs, or people in Arkansas, wherever. So these commentators a mixture of the traditionally educated and autodidacts, generally STEM-focused and with a higher-than-average share of people who identified as being on the autism spectrum, tended to be suspicious not just of humanities, of humanities as a discipline, but of all the ways in which human emotional response clouded practical judgment. So Robert Sapolsky, I think of him, but because he, he, he can look at the big picture and see how it all fits together. So just because you're a STEM guy doesn't mean you're not emotional, you're not human, you're not wired like all other human beings, and that you don't have needs and feelings and so on, and that you can't read a novel or a poem and not be touched by music and so on. You know, wow, that music gave me goosebumps. So somehow you think you're really, really smart and you're into STEM or math, not necessarily theoretical mathematics, but math, (laughs) programming, ooh, Perl, you know, computer languages. And and, uh, all this emotional stuff just clouds your judgment like you're Spock on Star Trek. You know, but I have human humanity in me. I'm part human, but, you know, I'm logical. I think it's kind of silly, but people do view themselves that way. You know, it's got to be empirical. It's got to be scientific. There has to be good data behind it. Yeah, I got to crunch the numbers. You have to look at it 
from a probabilistic standpoint. If you're going to prove or not prove the existence of Jesus Christ as real human being in historical context, you're going to have to use probabilistic, you know, Bayesian theory and so on and so forth. Yeah, okay, whatever. And other people are just like, you know, I like that story. The guy's a pretty good guy in some ways. It's moral and ethical lessons to be learned there, but whatever. I'm going to go sit under a tree and get skinny and meditate until the lion finds me and eats me and then becomes more beautiful by ingesting my flesh into his body so that he can go catch a gazelle next time, which tastes better than human beings. Human, all too human. Okay, so central to the rationalist worldview was the idea that nothing, not social niceties, not fear of political incorrectness, certainly not unwarranted emotion, could or should get between human beings and their ability to apprehend the world as it really is. So for me, most of the really smart people, Carl Sagan or, you know, Feynman or whoever you want to point to, even, even uh, you know, Christopher Hitchens, new atheist thing, he, he understood that to read Shakespeare, you had to know your Bible. I mean, these people understand humanity, even though they're geniuses. So the credo was truth for truth's sake or whatever. I, I just don't see, I see that as kind of a weird, I identify as, as one of these really smart people who knows truth for truth's sake. And it's almost just like uh, an evangelical coming up to you and telling you that he believes everything in the Bible is absolutely literally true and you should too. Now, even though you can do the math and the philosophy and the logic and the critical thinking, it doesn't necessarily make you that much better than other people, right? So truth, the rationalists generally believed, would set humanity free. Sure, well, truth. And also truth is contingent and temporary and subject to change as new data comes in and new tools are discovered to learn about how nature works. So, you know, electron microscopes as opposed to what they had back in the day. I forget the first microscope, but, you know, go back to the age of wonder or when germ theory was just being discovered. And now we have a lot more tools. So sure, that meant that tolerating the odd fascist, Nazi, or neo-reactionary in the less wrong Star Slate Codex comments section, new right leader Curtis Yarvin, then, the, then writing as Mencius Moldbug was among them. And uh, Curtis Yarvin, I first became aware of him in, in that uh, venue. And then I started reading his stuff, Letter to Open-Minded Progressives or whatever it was. And I thought, yeah, this guy's interesting. He's fun to read. He's, he's uh, got some ideas. And I wanted to know, is there any substance there? He sounds like he's onto something, but maybe not. Maybe it's just, you know, <laughs> his style is cool. But it was, it was cool meeting uh, Curtis in that venue and then understanding what uh, NRX was and meeting accelerationists and all kinds of other people I didn't know existed. And would my life be terrible if I didn't know about these people? Probably not, but I'm interested, so it was fun for me. So... But free and open debate, even with people whose views you find abhorrent, was so central to the rationalist ethos that the most obvious alternative, the kinds of harm-focused safeguarding central to fostering the ostensibly safe spaces of the social justice left, seemed unthinkable. So you got to have thick skin. My best conversation today was my most difficult conversation. We argued to discover, knowing we can't injure ourselves. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Anyway, safe spaces. It's so weird. You know, people have to have such thick skin just to talk about 
data and statistics and different, you know, domains of science and whatnot, it's going to hurt. But, you know, you got lively debate. I think that's fun. I'm all, all for it. I don't like censorship. Um, you know, you have to look at things that are meant to harm, that are obviously done to hurt people. But other than that, everything should be open, I guess. I don't know. So uh, it it's this, uh, then eventually from these blogs, you know, these kind of NGOs and other um, organizations developed. So one was Center for Applied Rationality in Berkeley in 2012. And so it was to raise the sanity waterline. They focused on the big picture global level issues, most notably and controversially Yudowski's pet concern, the X risk, X for existential, that we will inadvertently create unfriendly artificial intelligence that will wipe out human life altogether. It's my belief that there isn't ever going to be such a thing as an unfriendly uh, general artificial intelligence that wants to kill people. Uh, it's going to be people using these tools. So it's how I program my little doggy MIT robot with a 30 caliber machine gun on its back to go in and shoot everybody with a certain kind of facial structure, or bone structure. And it's like, well, you know, that, that, that robot with the 30 cal with his AI in him, uh, he's not really a bad little doggy. He's just been programmed by some really evil motherfuckers who, you know, want to wipe out certain kinds of people, which is what we do. Our, our weapons become more and more high tech and they're really cool and they can do a lot, but they're still there just to kill people. Our job here at General Dynamics is killing people. That's what we do. We design machines that kill people effectively, efficiently, and so on. Yeah, okay, great, wonderful. Buy, buy shares. Get in the market. Buy shares. Buy low, sell high, make money. There were rationalist sister movements, the tra transhumanists who believed in hacking and improving the wetware of the human body, and the effective altruists who posited that the best way to make the world a better place is to abandon cheap sentiment entirely such as our attachment to those who live in proximity to us, and figure out how to maximize one's overall utility to the wider world. In practice, that usually means making a lot of money at tech or finance jobs and then donating it to global health initiatives. There's a lot in this sentence that gets me going. So transhumanism, I think that's silly. I can't remember right off the top of my head at this particular moment what that Greek thing is, thought experiment where you, you're sailing a, a boat across the GNC and you, you're repairing it as you go. And after replacing all the planks and the mast and the sails and the booms and everything on the boat, is it still the same boat? <laughs> so that's a fun one. And uh, I think if we... If I uploaded my whatever scan of my nervous system and brain into some machine, I wouldn't be me anymore. I'd be something else. So I'm a human being. I have a, I have a short shelf life, and I'm vulnerable to many things, and I can die any time. And that's just part of being a human being. And the deep, beautiful nature of understanding humanity is understanding uh, mortality and all our emotions and how our, you know, things we can't control, autonomic nervous system, uh, whether or not I've got cancer growing in my uh, intestine right now, and I, I'm not aware of it, and it's spreading to other parts of my body, <laughs> or I get hit by a car tomorrow. You know, we just can't control everything. And even if you were on a machine on the moon powered by solar energy, or fusion energy or whatever on a server, that server could get hit by a freaking asteroid if you don't have a Dyson sphere around the sun and lots of things patrolling 
the solar system to make sure nothing bad ever happens, well, you might as well just cross yourself and pray to Jesus because we don't have control over everything, and we never will. And embracing life as a human being is a beautiful thing. Being vulnerable, needing help, helping others, caring, forgiving, feeling guilt, feeling compromised, <laughs> all these kinds of things. It's, it's part of life. You don't watch a movie because all the characters are invulnerable. Vulnerability is part of the beauty of a character in a story. So you have to abandon cheap sentiment entirely? I don't think so, man. Unless you're going to watch a movie and never cry. You know, you're going to watch um, uh, Ted Lasso and never tear up. I feel sorry for you. I mean, gosh, come on, man. You're going to watch that uh, song contest and not be excited for, by the, some of the contestants? Oh, poor guy. And you're going to maximize over your utility by giving mosquito nets to Africa while you buy up all the real estate in America because you're really after control. And at the end of the day, it's not your philanthropy that matters. It's, you know, uh, how it enhances your power and control. Because the guy who has everything can always use more control. So, yeah, and then they point fingers, the reactionaries, and say, utilitarianism, it sucks. Jeremy Bentham, you know. Uh, hey, come on, man. There is utility out there in the world, and utilitarianism in some jackets is a cool thing and a good thing. And it's there anyway. Got to deal with progress. Got to deal with utility factors, consequentialism, ethics, because it's there. And uh, I don't know. It's frustrating to me, but no, i got to have an argument with the utilitarians because I'm a reactionary. Well, whatever. But you still employ utilitarian thinking from time to time, don't you? Don't you? You're still rational, aren't you? Aren't you? Sorry, I don't mean to mock, but it's frustrating to me. People got to reach across and understand one another, understand the value of their thing so they can learn from it. And I don't know. I just think that's important. Yeah, so you, you make a lot of money and you, you, you give a little money and it's like putting a Band-Aid. So live aid, remember the 90s and 2000s, we wanted to stop starvation, so we'd go to a rock concert and listen to our favorite rock bands. And uh, this is going to help people. Well, it, it probably saved lives at the time, but it didn't solve uh, hunger problems in the world. And it's not going to solve problems with, uh, you know, agriculture when climate change and global warming hit a certain area. You know, there's still problems to be solved always. And just doing the fun thing and putting the money in the plate when it's passed around at church isn't enough. You kind of have to walk the walk, you know, to in community with other people. You have to develop a whole culture with certain values. And that would be extremely strong and powerful and resilient and sustainable. But how do you do that? It's pretty hard. Everybody thinks they've got the answer. Their, their little pet thing is going to solve all the problems. So in his ethnography of the rationalist, journalist Tom Shivers recounts one group that uses a randomized but weighted math game to determine how to split restaurant bills fairly. And when I read that sentence, I, I think of, uh, you know, Bateman and uh, American Psycho and, you know, business cards. <laughs> it's like... Oh, that's a fun little math game, and we can look up all kinds of obscure things on Wikipedia, and it's fun to learn about them, but, you know, come on, man. Smile at the waiter. Tip the waiter. Don't worry about splitting the bill too accurately. You got more money than I do today. You pay a little more, whatever. It's all about the relationship and living well and feeling good, I guess, but if you have to do it properly... Uh, because you're on the autism spectrum, because that became very popular 
10, 15 years ago. Everybody's autistic now. I hate to say that because I don't want to, you know, sound bad because people do have autism. People are transsexual. People do uh, have uh, health problems and whatever. And you don't want to denigrate that or make light of it. But it does kind of become a trend. And you can look at that statistically and say, wow, we, according to really good data, before uh, 2009, there, there was an average of this. And with the same really good data, after 2012, it spiked. So why, why did that happen? Was it social media or was it just that something in the water made everybody autistic? You know, they all got vaccinated. <laughs> something like that. I don't know. It, you have to parse it. You have to figure it out. So anyway, Peter Thiel gave over a million to Yudkowsky uh, Machine Intelligence Research Institute. Now that's like, you know, giving a penny to a guy and saying, go down to Subway and buy a sandwich or whatever. He's got a lot of money. A million dollars is like a backhanded insult. But it's a million dollars, right? And you you have Elon Musk and all this stuff and all these like effective altruists who are con men, like Sam Bankman Fried was arrested and charged with fraud, conspiracy to commit money laundering. So apparently if you steal and rob and defraud people, as long as you're putting the money to a good cause, it's okay. But we know uh, criminals are in that cohort people who are ambitious, people who uh, want to get super rich, people who think they have invented something fantastic when they're just, um, it's just a derivative on something else that was, uh, came to be over decades of research and development across all kinds of private and public institutions. <laughs> and then suddenly, I capitalized on it. I'm a genius. Um, well, yeah, you're a genius in capitalizing on something. Good for you, um, Mr. Zuckerberg. Um, but uh, you know, you didn't you didn't invent that thing. That's why Elon Musk is so tiring because he wants to take credit for everything that he has no business taking credit for. Other than his ability to get money out of investors, which he's really good at. So vitamin deficiency, I want to save all of humanity, the most exciting time of my career by quite a lot. You know, it's effective altruism. It's a big deal. You have a center for it now. The center had been founded in Oxford in 2011 to help maximize giving and career impact. I thought this thing is perfect, he told me in a Zoom interview. We're going to figure out exactly where money should go and how to improve the world. And if we're wrong, we'll figure it out. We'll figure out how we're wrong and then we'll fix it. And I like the spirit of that. So on my website, I say something like that. You know, people who think they can find solutions, it's a good thing. But it's never that simple. You know, we're going to find, I'm going to know where the money should go. My uh, charitable institution, my thing's going to find it out rationally, scientifically. Then we're going to nudge everybody to go in that direction. The world's just going to get fixed. That's why people get tired of progressivism because they sense that there's some kind of a scam in there, that it doesn't work that, that way, that cleanly. And if we're wrong, we'll figure it out and we'll fix it. You know, oops, I made a mistake there, but we can fix this thing, you know. Yeah, maybe. I mean, we should try. We must try. We do try. But it's not a perfect thing. It never is because human beings just aren't perfect. So then you can go back to the conservative thing. James Burnham, the Machiavellians, defenders of freedom. What is human nature? Plasticity physically and, and also in our brain and uh, in our culture. And so there's all kinds of possibilities there. 
and they coexist different ways of doing things and living and different belief systems. And they tend to work pretty good. Human beings can live in lots of different ways. And finding the perfect way, the Star Trek answer, isn't going to happen. Not for a long, long time. We need to start thinking about how to, how to give ourselves some time so we can accomplish these things. And being a little bit more patient, a little bit more human, a little bit more natural, if I do say so myself, since we depend on nature, since we are part and parcel of nature. And if we screw up, let me interject. Sometimes I think that accelerationists, uh, Lane and people like that, they just don't like people. Somehow they were disappointed, hurt maybe, or their brain just goes in so many directions so fast that they're angry that nobody else you know, gets it or can keep up. And they just want humanity to fail. They can't stand flesh and blood, meat packet people, and they want them to disappear and be replaced by technology <laughs> that people made. And somehow technology that people made is going to be better than people and for some reason. We'll all be dead, but technology will be there. I don't get it. Our life support system, our spaceship Earth, we're, we're fucked. So anyway... Effective altruism, he found, depowered a lot of people. It made them less interesting and vibrant as people and more like trying to fit into a slightly soulless bureaucracy of doing good. It's very easy to go through the motions to go to church to say you're a Christian and then think about killing everybody, you know, <laughs> killing all the brutes. Kill them. They don't believe. Um and it can be soulless to just, you know, say I'm giving 90% of my money away. I'm still super rich, but I give all my money away. And I give it to the right things because I know what the right things are. So I'm cool. And then you go home and you feel like nothing. Nothing happened. Because in my opinion, and there are all kinds of people in the world, and some people don't thrive in relationships, but I think it's the community thing that gives your life meaning. And if you're lacking in that, you go home alone and you say, I just gave all this money away. Why don't I feel better? So there's a vitamin deficiency. So likewise, Tyler Alterman was talking about his vitamin deficiency. He says it took years of basically being disabled, disabled to the point of not being able to work, to realize that, oh, actually these things that I deem to be irrational or like useless types of creativity, were essential to my functioning. He longed to form genuine friendships based on mutual affinity and understanding rather than by screening potential friends for qualities that would make them a good ally, which will contribute to you both working on existential risk together in an effective way. But, you know, without the existential ri risk goal, mitigating that, we all do this. You know, what's going, what people are going to make me a more s successful real estate agent or lawyer or doctor or, you know, how am I going to compete with the other contractors and so on? Who do I need to know if I join the Shriners or some other uh, group? Am I going to get more customers? Am, am I going to fit in? Am, can I influence, make friends and influence people and all that kind of stuff? So if things are too highly utilitarian, it becomes soulless. And he's recognizing that vitamin deficiency. So it turns out that like, intuition is, in, is incredibly powerful, an incredibly powerful epistemic tool, he said that it just seems like a lot of rationalists weren't using because it falls into this domain of woo stuff. And the critics weren't isolated. More and more rationalists and fellow travelers were yearning to address personal existential crises alongside global existential risk. And you have to see, they have platforms 
where people are in these cliques, these little isolated, small, tiny little cliques in the world, are reading each other's stuff, commenting on each other's stuff, uh, consuming each other's content, and then getting together on the online and talking about their thing. So it, it becomes a big deal. And there's contagion in that. Yeah, me too. I'm feeling kind of meaningless also. Or I'm feeling like overly rationalistic. I'm, I'm Feynman, Feynman or Feynman. And I feel terrible because I'm just so damn smart. And I, but I still have fun with my kids and still have a great sense of humor and still talk about all kinds of mundane things. Blah, blah, blah. But we're with our people. And it's meaningful to have a meaning crisis. It's, it's cool, man. You know, let's figure out just how profound Jordan Peterson really is. There's something there, man, something there. It's not a Joseph Campbell thing. It's, it's different. You know, it's, it's not, a, not one of these things. You know, it's mythology, but it's not that. You don't read Jung. You have to have neo-Jungianism. You have to have somebody interpreting it again in a different way, with different language, in a different context, because they're victims of woke. And, the, and political correctness. And so they're special. They're part of our time. I like Joseph Campbell because he doesn't care about any of that stuff. He didn't have to. And he just got on with talking about the profundity and the joy of understanding mythology and stories and heroes' journeys and whatnot. He was a great guy. Not that attractive to some of the modern folk who I'd, I'd suggest to people, go to the primary sources, read Freud if you want to, and figure it out for yourself. You can obviously get read books where people are talking about Freud, which is also good, but maybe your own ideas will be more profound to you than somebody else parroting somebody else's ideas parroting somebody else's ideas. So when people, res people respond to something, Sargent told me in a phone interview, there's some hunger here. What is that hunger aimed at? And you can aim it at the right thing. Oh, sorry. And can you aim it at the right thing? Whatever was out there and however you could or couldn't justify it with propositional truth claims or Bayesian reasoning, it probably pointed out, pointed to something worth exploring. So better to be interesting and wrong. Well, I, that's an interesting statement there, but you'd have to look at the context <clears throat> to know how profound that insight is, but here we go. So in the late uh, 2010s, yeah, Peter Thiel again. You're going to meetups with tarots and all kinds of fun little things, body work and meditation. Ah, so began to look into more esoteric topics such as intention research, how practitioners of body work, energy healing, mesmerism, could use nonverbal cues to subtly influence the mindset of people on whom they worked. So mesmerism, I think of James Randi, I think of pickpockets, I think of magicians, body work. I mean, it goes way back. The uh, Feldenkrais and, and all these different uh, things that were going on in the 60s and 70s, and now it's updated. So you have Reiki, and now it's updated Reiki, and you have CAM, comp complementary alternative medicine. And, you know, where was herbal medicine, traditional medicine? Now it's, it's special again, you know. It's infused because I'm a scientist and I found out there's something there in the placebo. The mysterious magic of, of placebo isn't just regression to the mean. It's something more profound, you know. There's something there in the mystery, which is cool. I think it's cool. But all we're doing is we're going through another cycle of discovering these things that we've been discovering over and over again for generations, thousands of years. And now we're 
we're blending that with science, engineering, and technology, and these other ways of understanding nature. And we're trying to integrate them again. <clears throat> make them make sense. So there's the rise of what you could call popular neo-Jungianism. Figures like Jordan Peterson, who point to the power of myth. And I'm, I'm, I just said I'm a Campbell fan. Ritual and a relationship to the sacred as a vehicle for combating postmodern alienation, often in uneasy alliance with traditionalist Christians. A whole article could be written on Peterson's close intellectual relationship with Roman Catholic Bishop Robert Barron. And he's an interesting guy. I have a lot of friends, uh, you know, presbyters and uh, Catholics and uh, all kinds of different people that I think are extremely honest intellectuals and very open-minded and eclectic in their knowledge who are people of deep faith. So I, I don't hold that against anybody. If you have a friend who's a bishop, um, you got to be traditionalist nowadays, trad, that's a cool thing. Um, anyhow, yeah, myth ritual. Yeah, we do get lost because we don't have the campfire anymore. We're not playing music and singing and dancing with one another anymore. Or going to the festivals, we don't have time. We're online, we're learning all this stuff. We're making tons of money. So there's the openly fascist version lurking at the margins of the new right where blood and soil nationalists, paleo bodybuilders, Julius Avola, reading traditionalists like Steve Bannon and Catholic set of vacantist podcasters make common cause in advocating for the revival of the moors of a mystic and masculine past all the better to inject life into the sclerotic modern world. Like somehow if we don't become, you know, just meat eaters or vegans or, you know, we don't do some extreme thing that we're suddenly in a sclerotic modern world, I think people are still doing all kinds of interesting things and getting it. But you go online and you get caught up in these little bubbles and you feel like, oh, no, I'm not even human anymore. I, I, don't, I forgot how to rub, hug a tree. And So the ceremony would have culminated if a stubborn candle hadn't refused to go out in total darkness, during which... We were invited to meditate upon the finality of death, the non-existence of God, and the sole avenue for hope, supporting financially, intellectually, or otherwise quixotic scientific initiatives capable of prolonging life or of eliminating death altogether. Well, would that be good? I mean, <clears throat> I've said it many times before, but you know, I think I'd get pretty bored with myself after a couple hundred more years. I mean, I'm still going to be me in one way or another. You'd have to be pretty vain and enamored with yourself to want to live forever or think that your intellectual capacity, your brain was so profoundly unique that it had to survive, you know, like Richard Feynman or Einstein or somebody. Um, forever and ever because there was just so much product that was going to come out of it, you know, um, beautiful minds and all that kind of thing. Whereas uh, you're probably not going to get that much better. Somebody else is going to come stand on your shoulders and create something totally new because of their unique circumstances, endocrine system, nervous system, brain, interaction with nature, with life, experience, education, <laughs> and all that kind of stuff, genes. But somehow we want to live forever. I don't get that. I mean, there's something beautiful about having a family, seeing the next generation go on, getting old, and just recognizing that this is a limited journey. Now, if you want to be transhumanist and upload your whatever, whatever the heck it is, into some other medium, whatever it turns out to be in the future, um, silicon or whatever, you know, 
whatever kind of chip is running the the algorithms that are running the scan of whatever the hell you are. It's not going to be you. And whatever comes of it, the interactions with its environment, meaning all the stuff going on in the database, isn't going to be you. I don't know how that experiences anything. I mean, you stub your toe, you know you stubbed your toe. You feel pain, you feel pleasure, you feel emotion. Your, uh, you know, the endocrine system reacting and interacting with your habits and experiences and needs of the moment and everything going on around you have diff certain responses. You know, it's all pretty plastic, but it's, it's utterly flesh and blood. And you're not going to be that. So, yeah, people get, get all transcendental and they think about their spirit versus their, their body, you know, in, in temporal life existing in this illusion or whatever it is. Is it samsara? Is it real? Is it uh, um, just a parallel universe kind of uh, simulacrum of something or another? you know, transcendental substance goop floating around in the void of whatnots with dark energy and dark matter having all of its effects on everything. I mean, these are all mysteries. But you have a pretty good sense of what's going on in your life, right? And if you're a simple person, you know, you're buying bananas and feeding the kids and getting them off to school and and maybe you have a hobby or you like your plants or your dog or whatever, and you're living your life. But uh, in the West, we're all pretty special people. We're pretty outrageously intelligent and brilliant and beautiful because we've done all of these self-help uh, things. We've developed ourselves so much that we are very special individuals that need to continue in perpetuity in the universe. The universe somehow needs us. And it's funny, when you look at photos of things hundreds of years ago, uh, and you look at the faces, Civil War faces or whatever, hundreds of years ago, there weren't photographs, but you know, you look at a painting or you look at photos of the Civil War or World War I or 1920s Germany, and you, you recognize these faces. I mean, they almost could be a friend of yours, you know? I, the, what's passed on through our genes is profound. There is a memory there. There's a continuity. So in a way, there is teleos in, in, the, in the flesh. You know, that we're, we're going, we're continuing. There's a continuum, you know, of the future and the past and the present. And you can think of these in mystical ways, which is also very, very nice, poetical ways, metaphorical ways, um, ineffable ways. You can have experiences that, are beyond words. And in those moments, time dilates and, you know, you kind of have a forever moment. You have an experience. And if you cherish those experiences, embrace them, and, uh, you know, remember them, uh, they are pretty much sacred moments that last forever in a certain sense. But whatever. I mean, you know, you can read Eckhart or... <laughs> whatever mystic or whatever you want to to get poetic ideas about that but i think everybody has those experiences when they're children and even when they're adults and so uh, these are your profound moments of eternity but you know you need jordan peterson to tell you about that or some other writer that's fine why not if if you resonate with with those people and they bring out a sense of something that you've experienced or need to experience or crave or want or desire, the vitamin deficiency can be filled through art and literature, music, and so on. So moving on, post-rationalism's uh, freewheeling eclecticism. If rationality culture arose out of a very specific early 2000s blog culture, just think of that. So it arose out of a blog culture, okay? So before that, what, what did we have? Cafe culture, Montparnasse or whatever. Um, you know, you go to the salon and you chat with all the other um, 
want to be literary big shots or artists and whatnot and experience that smoke cigarettes and drink absinthe <laughs> it must have been freaking glorious Reminds me of the days on Grant Avenue in San Francisco, and I'm glad I had those days. Or in Tokyo, uh, Rock Mother Pub in Tokyo, Shimo Kitazawa. <laughs> it's fantastic. And walking around Shanghai and really being able to imagine the 20s and 30s, because the architecture, Art Nouveau, Art Deco, it's everywhere. And you can see the past and feel it and you kind of know the history because you've read some books you're looking around everything has a a deeper meaning and context because you understand the history and it's profound but we're with our blog cult culture we're sitting at home on our screens uh titillating our intellects and trying to be the smartest guy in the room so big name essayists like less wrong Eliza Yudowski and Slate Scar Star Codex Scott Alexander, meticulously parsed by hyper-serious interlocutors in the comments section, post-strat culture. I love that, post-strat. Anyway, I read about that. Where am I? So continuing with the meta tribe, and we have meta modernism, that whole thing uh, coming from different cultures. Another thing I wanted to quickly mention was that, uh, you know, we, we all want to go back to our own cultures and put up the walls and live pure lives with our own blood and all that kind of thing. But, you know, culture is a lot more similar across nation states now than it was hundreds of years ago, you look at music, art, culture, and so on, and you see how it's kind of global now in certain ways. There are big differences between Filipinos and Vietnamese people, but there are a lot of things we share. And we know that. We can go online and talk to people from around the world, and they recognize us. There's a theory of mind there, a theory of culture that bridges the gap between pure uh, culture like Japanese culture that you might have imagined existed in the in the 17th century and Japanese culture now how different it is in Korean culture how similar it is to Japan but yet very very different and so on and there are these similarities so when you go there they're not looking at you as a gaijin or farang or Wai Guoren or whatever, and saying, whoa, look at that foreigner, estrangeiro, you know, the outsider. And they're so different. I look into their eyes and they don't even look human. So when we're othering, we're really taking a big, huge leap to scapegoat people and to other them and to imagine that they're so different from us. We know they're not. Oh, there are differences. We need to understand those differences. But they're not as as the gap between one tribe and another isn't as, as big now as we might think it is. So we have our meta tribes committed to the notion that our emotional and spiritual lives are as fundamental to human flourishing as our intellectual ones. Being allergic to potential ideology, as Alterman told me in our interview, meta tribe members are often political magpies, taking their practices and theories from across the ideological spectrum, even as their commitment to radical openness renders them at times uncomfortably close to more explicit right wing circles like the intellectual dark web, at least according to their progressive critics. <clears throat> so, we wouldn't feel happy if we couldn't say we transcend ideology and yet <laughs> we're closer to this than that. And we have to label things, right-wing circles, intellectual dark web. What's right-wing about Sam Harris and these people? I think they're just honest intellectual interlocutors who are trying to parse and understand and get at what's going on in the world, in culture, a truth in terms of how to think about how nature works and whatnot. And, all, you know, when you're looking at culture, there are goofy things going on and people disagree about them and there are trends that, are, that rub people the wrong way or concern people. 
And these people talk about it. So what? Oh, they're dark. They're, you know, uh, blah, blah. Well, this is fun. It's good marketing. It's good PR. It's a good way to create an audience. And then once you have the audience, you can talk to the other people. You know, the post ideologues or whatever you want, whatever the new jargon's going to be. And they're going, you can grift some of their audience because they're a little bit more in a Jonathan Haidt way in this particular category for various reasons. And, and so they gravitate towards that group, that click. But then you have the conversation and then you can grift audience from each other and build your audience and make money and have a successful career, write a few books. Nothing wrong with any of that. But we should be able to take a step back and say, what exactly is the intellectual dark web? How do they define it? How would they talk about it? Members of that clique. Who decided there was a clique? And what are their criticisms of the clique? Why do they think they're, they're closer to right wing as opposed to uh, middle of the road or left wing? You know, and when people want to talk about their, their Marxism or their syndi uh, anarcho-syndicalism or whatever thing you have, um, you know, how do you define it? How do they define it themselves? How did Chomsky define it versus somebody now? Uh, where did it come from originally? Who came up with the term? Why? What's the context behind that? Just, you know, at least recognize that all of that context exists. And the emergent qualities of the ideas are there. And they have connections, networks, and so on. Axons and whatever. You can put it in any kind of metaphorical terms. But um, dendrites, you know. Anyhow, yeah. So, uh, anyhow, so, yeah. So the Greeks were... It wasn't that unusual for someone to be both a philosopher and a wrestler. Wow. You're, you're a Renaissance man. Well, you can pound a nail and, and, and write about law and so on and so forth. I think the founding fathers were fairly careful and very, very thoughtful people. And we don't have careful and thoughtful people much in politics anymore. But yeah, you in the olden days, you probably had to be a philosopher and a wrestler because it was harder to specialize unless you were rich. And then you could sit in the Senate all day long, uh, arguing with your, your peers and go to the baths and then go to the games and then have a banquet and, and all that kind of thing. Worry about who your son's going to marry, your daughter's going to marry, alliances, who, who you're going to patronize. Uh, who you're going to take care of, uh, alliances and all that shit. So you probably had to have more skills uh, um, unless you were a simple farmer and then you cared about the water table and the soil and animal husbandry and having enough children to, to run the farm and all that kind of stuff. So they, they at once evoke the classic California ideology famously described in, the 1995, in 1995 by Richard Barbrook and Andy Cameron, equal parts hippie, mysticism, and relentless self-development, and subvert its linear narrative of human progress. So, yeah, hi hippie, mystic, self-development, all the body work, the Feldenkrais, the Tai Chi, the yoga, the hot yoga, <laughs> all the, all the uh, self-help seminars, motivational seminars until you realize that motivation doesn't work. It's all about habits and what you do. And, you know, all that. and then you get so good, so enamored with yourself that you have to live forever because the world can't, the universe can't do without you, my friend. You're so special. I mean, there is, you know, a lot to be said for self-esteem, but you can take it a little too far, I think. Now we get to John Verveke, and I like John. He's interesting. Uh, he resonates with me, but, you know, it, he's not a, my guru by any stretch. And I'm not going to cop his language about everything and parrot Verveke. Oh, Bulliam T. talks Verveke. Um, I don't want to do that because I'm a goofball and I, I express myself in my goofball way. And we'll, you know, if someday I ever have anything to say, I'll try to say it my way, 
without using chat, <laughs> GDP or whatever. A cognitive scientist at the University of Toronto whose work many of the Metatribe cite as highly influential calls the Metatribe's practice of reinventio in Latin. Verbecki told me in a Zoom interview, inventio means invent and discover. So you're reinventing and discovering. When has that not occurred? Maybe if we go back 100,000 years, but it was happening, not at the same pace and volume uh, that it happens now, but it was happening. Maybe the nozzle wasn't closed up too tight <laughs> and, and, you know, blowing the world away. But people were inventing and discovering all the time, but we have to have a new word for it, so we have to call it inventio. And that's cool. That goes on your PowerPoint deck. That goes in your book. You coined a phrase, you're special. And I have no problem with that. I'm not criticizing it. It's just what happens, and it's cool. And people love it. And then we can say inventio, and everybody gets excited because Bulliam T. used the word inventio. These guys, whenever I listen to them, I'm, I'm hearing books that I read 20, 30 years ago. And, uh, you know, things I've listened to and whatever. It's there somewhere. It's not in my active memory right off the top of my head, but it's there. And I'm thinking, oh, where have I heard these ideas before? Oh, did that, where did that come from? Anyway, it's Vervecki's. It's all mixed together, Vervecki said. This is one of the most culturally significant things that is happening right now. This reinventio of what sacredness means and what the experience of sacredness sacredness points to, which has moved out of being the proprietary purview of the established religions. Religions, Vervecki says, are still important partners in the process, but they don't have the monopoly on it anymore. Well, I want to know about the qualia. So you have all these different kinds of religious sects in Buddhism, in Christianity, in Islam, all the big ones. And you have all these other uh, mystical and pagan and Wiccan and whatever. Qualia of these experiences when one feels something sacred or when one has some kind of transcendental or spiritual experience, uh, psychologically, physically, and so on, are they not pretty similar? I mean, going back to like our cultures not being that different anymore, are, are they not pretty similar? Uh, I, they're just wrapped in something different in a culture. So they're wrapped in a Luther or Calvinism or Catholicism or Orthodoxy, or they're wrapped in, in uh, Hinayana or, or whatever, Buddhism, in, in these sects, right? And so the language the expression, and there's, there's a difference, there's a thing going on there. Well, uh, those differences have been around forever. People have been redefining themselves. Joseph Smith finds all those golden uh, palettes in it, it somewhere, and, and it is written, God gave me a message, and blah, blah, blah. And this is the way we do it now, and, and redefined and uh, reimagined. And so we're going to do that now. Of course we have to. Things are coming online, literally. And so we're faced with all these new things. We have to somehow incorporate them into our sense. But at the bottom of all of this, or at the crux of it, is life and the interwovenness, interdependencies, the networks, the ecologies of life systems, living systems on our planet Earth. And whether or not we want to take care of, love that, understand it, make it work for humanity as well as for the systems themselves that require life to thrive, to flourish, to work so that our species can continue to exist. But somehow we're special and our terminology is best, obviously. You know, Martin Luther puts that note up on the wall, and there you go. The printing press helped and all that stuff, and we're on to a new thing. <clears throat> but it's not that unique, but we have to think it is, because we're all very important people, and we're all very vain people, and we're all slaves to fashion. 
So it has to be special. We have to differentiate our genius and our uh, intuitions and our voices from everybody else and, you know, grab an audience. That's the name of the game. But are you really going to connect with the whole world and come follow me? We're going to be like William T now and everything's going to be perfect. Uh, obviously not. <laughs> there will be a lot of pain and suffering before something else emerges that has coherence and continuity and strength and resilience and sustainability. That's my opinion. Circumstances will dictate, and circumstances is a brutal dictator, especially when you're not really taking care of things. So yes, this is sacred, but what are you doing to maintain and support the sacred? Are you in your game B community herding cats, deciding, you know, who's going to come to my DAO? This is the way it is. I wrote, um, uh, you know, the constitution of it. If you like it, if it resonates, come on. You have the right to exit. I have my own token, blah, blah, blah. We can trade it for rubles. And so you have a billion of these little communities around the world, and somehow they're trading to, to, together because we have blockchains and smart contracts, and logistics are special now because we have wind-powered something or another, or we have hyperloops, or we have hypersonic jet airplanes that run on the ether, or you know some mysterious dark matter energy that we haven't discovered yet. <laughs> and so it's going to be great. In the meantime... We have real problems that we can't even get together and work on because we're so busy building weapons for war, putting all of our genius and material science and everything into a better jet airplane with more computer chips in it, more algorithms and programs and touchscreen uh, you know, screens and whatnot so we can blow up things. And good old Elon's out there in Texas just destroying uh, the surrounding area with his fun little project, this go nowhere thing that's just wrecking everything, and there's no way to regulate it because it's it's the money. <clears throat> and he's a genius, don't you know? So Vervecki's work deals extensively with what he calls the modern meaning crisis. So you go around the world and you say, does your life have meaning? And everybody goes, no, I'm so angst. I'm in an existential crisis. I'm going to lose it. I got to smoke billions of cigarettes with, with uh, uh, Simone de Bouvier and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, I don't think people necessarily think there's a meaning crisis unless you're in this world that says, your thing isn't meaningful, dude, you know. Of course, social media has cut into that because meaning comes out of relationships. And whatever the relationship is with, the water table and the soil and the animals or the people or the office or whatever, the meaning comes through the relationship at church, at the temple, uh, at the zendo, whatever. Uh, when you're playing sports, basketball, on the court, on the pitch, Meaning comes out of these inter interactions you have with people that you're in relationship with. So meaning crisis, get the fuck off the computer. Shut down the goddamn Zoom. Go out into your neighborhood and connect with people. And then publish your books. Have your, uh, your cons, you know, your, your death cons and your cartoon cons and your meaning crisis cons and get together and say, dude, yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Let me get your Twitter, Twitter handle and let's all sit around on our telephones the whole time. Instead of, you know, people come and visit me, they have to microdose the whole time. And then they wonder if, if Portugal's beautiful or if it was the mushrooms. And you can't slow down and have a conversation because people are moving from one thing to the next thing so fast while they're trying to understand everything, because we all have to be geniuses, they're going so fast that, uh, you know, they can't, they can't uh, really connect. And it leaves you feeling derelict and bereft of real connection with people. Although you can get together once in a while and say, yeah, I read your work, I read your blog, it's great stuff. You're pretty cool. And then I'll never see you again, or I'll see you next year in a couple of years. 
And then people have problems with their families and their children and their wives and husbands, and they can't even get that together. So I think we, we've got to slow down. That's one prescription I have, Bowie MT says, slow down, smell the roses. We don't understand what we're living for, according to Vervecki. Yep. Rationalist culture, to say nothing of our contemporary world more broadly, has, in its technocratic worship of human computing power, lost sight of the more complex questions involved in living the good life, or what he calls wisdom. Okay, the good life and wisdom. Epicureans, Stoics. Uh, where have we heard this before? In China, you know, um, Confucianism and, and whatever. Where have we heard all this before? You know, the good life. How do we define it? In what context? In what social, cultural context? Yeah, yeah. How, how do we find wisdom? And wisdom takes time. You, you're not, you're a pretty wise kid for a 25 year old, but you're not wise, wise. You need a lot more experience for that. I love your novel when you were 23. It was great. And maybe you ran out of juice when you were 35, but. You know, I'd love to hear what you have to say now that you're 60. So our Cartesian reduction of rationality to sort the computational abilities and then the reduction of that to just communication and communicative manipulation, we have lost a lot, said Vervecki. And this is interesting, Cartesian, right? So you think of the rationalists, Leibniz, Leibniz uh, Spinoza, Descartes, the context of their world when they were, when they were, you know, discussing their thing. And you think of idealism and skepticism in, in a different sense than we know it now. You know, if you're talking about Kant or whatever, I don't know if you read that much philosophy or not, but it's interesting. They have a context. Now we're bringing all this forward and putting it into this new context where there's all this technology, all these black boxes and co computers and algorithms and AIs and whatnot and globalism, global world. Uh, how do we define ourselves? What is our tribe? What, what is our meta-modern thing? It's a conundrum and everything's moving so fast. So that's why these things exist. That's why I'm wallowing around in rebel wisdom for months. You know, and listening to these people. So, yeah, that notion of rationality that rationalists are making use of is seriously truncated, seriously missing what most of the ancient world thought they were referring to. And that's the context I'm talking about. They used words like logos and ratio, ratio, sorry. And those older notions of rationality were bound up with wisdom, were bound up with practice, with the use of the imaginal. This is all true, and I don't see why it wouldn't be that way for all of us. And I would venture to say that if you had a deep conversation with one of the rationalist folks, or utilitarian folks or whatever, you'd find that they have those elements in them as well. It's just not embedded in a culture where it's understood what that wisdom comes from and what it's for. Uh, so yeah, uh, it's important. And I think and talk about wisdom a lot. And it's, it's a thing, and I, even though I can't exactly define it. So that which the imagination can transform rather than merely imaginary with ritual, ritual transformation, aspiration. And so all of those things are now coming back in. Well, I wonder when we lost them because I remember in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, they were there and 2000s. I mean, they were there. So I guess they got pushed out with social media and just destroyed in the Western world, in the weird world of Anglo intellectualism. And then somehow, you know, they're being allowed back in again or we're fixing it. 
I think we've just started to break down. I don't know how we fix it, not in this clique or in these cliques, even though they're very clear thinking and I resonate with their intuitions and their what they're saying intellectually. But we've just started to break down and, and new technologies coming online is just going to make it harder for people. Of course, AI is good in many ways and chat GDP and all these things can be extremely useful. And maybe we don't have to think in certain ways that we thought in ways that we thought uh, in the 19th or 18th century. Uh, and our abstract thought improves because of our context and the way we experience things and are educated and whatnot. But at some point, um, we're going to be outsourcing to the oracle a lot. So wisdom is going to have another context. You know, the wise words of the oracle. You know, go to this search engine, type it in, or just, you know, it's implanted in your brain or in your smart device. And you're deferring to it all the time, referring and deferring to it all the time. And it becomes your universe. It becomes what you believe to be true and wise and good. And what is that connected to? What is that net networked in with? Is, does it have anything to do with nature? You know, uh, can we use sensors and AIs and so on for to develop a, a kind of agriculture that's more sustainable and better for the planet and sequesters carbon and does all these natural services that we need done? Or do we just, uh, you know, get more and more off into this netherworld of, of whatever, transhumanism and singularity and not, not even wanting to be part of nature anymore? And, and who's going to be doing that? In what bubbles, in what little city-states that are completely divorced from the rest of the world? Teal islands and so on. Places in New Zealand where, you know, the rich people go and live according to whatever and while they rewild the rest of the planet after a pandemic or after a war. <laughs> You just have to leave it all alone and it'll come back. Nature will take care of itself. The earth will be around a long time after our species has gone extinct. Of course. But what about us doing something to create the Garden of Eden together as a project in communities around the world and saying this might be nice, better for future generations, for our children, and then we work on those projects together and we come up with something fantastic. And we can do it in a pluralistic way. We can have different game bees, communities, and different cultures, different languages, different types of music. And hopefully we dance together, we play music together, we do all these things together. Uh, you know, we're longing for that. You see it in these movements, in these cliques how to get there with the technology, make it work for us, because at the end of the day, we're running the show. And the players are running us because they have the power, they have the influence, they have the resources, they have the financing. And we don't. So we're just pulled along. And we're kind of tools for the players. So the Bilderberg clique gets together and they talk about things. They genuinely want to improve things and progress, and make the world better. But they want to do it for them, for their system, for what made them rich and powerful. They're not going to give that away just because, you know, it might seem fashionable to be uh, philanthropic and ethical and care about the plebs and the proles. They're on a different level, and they think they know better, and they're going to take good care of us, we just have to fit in and do what we're told. And if that means universal basic income and renting and not owning anything and uh, being tracked 24-7 and having your government uh, token on your phone and <laughs> whatever it means, people telling you you can't use gasoline anymore. I don't care if they tell me I can't use gasoline anymore. I, I, I'd be fine with that. 
that people worry about because they're libertarian, they're in freedom and democracy, and, and they think that they're going to lose everything. But what do they have now? What kind of agency, what kind of power, what kind of knowledge, what kind of uh, intelligence? Are they players? Are they actually affecting the world in any way? shape or form other than their family and their friends and their businesses and their, you know, uh, yeah, we're on Zoom calls, man. My blog is read by millions of people. I got a billion likes when I inhaled the cinnamon on my YouTube channel. I'm, I'm an irrelevant person, validated. Yeah, it involves a holistic approach back to the article, to thinking. What does it mean to live a good life? That can't be quantified the way you can quantify, say, the number of malaria nets you've sent to the developing world. It's also unlike the often hyper-individualistic and autodidact-focused rationality culture, deeply wedded to a conception of tradition and of collected insights of others more broadly as a source of intellectual value. Yeah, so you, you, you graduated from Yale, but you're still an autodidact because you're learning yourself. So you have, maybe you have a structure in your mind, sociocultural and intellectual, like Sam Harris, but you're still studying and learning and so on. Or maybe you're just an autodidact, more of so like a Schmachtenberger. Who cares? You're learning stuff and you're articulating things. You're putting your ideas out there and you're sharing them, and you're getting, you're in conversation with other intelligent people, and you're trying to figure things out. Some people need to do that. Not all of us, obviously, but I wish that all of us would um, level up our game a little bit so that we can understand what these people are giving us or taking away from us. So mature wisdom, after all, takes a village says Vervecki, you have to acquire identities and roles and responsibilities and virtues in order to properly become wise. That takes a community that is willing to hang with you for a long time, which means the best shot of finding such a community is one that has a tradition and a history behind it. That's right. So where does that tradition and history come from? Uh, your culture, your blood and soil, or does it come from the new thing that you're creating, the game B thing or whatever, whatever, you know, thing, zeitgeist, you know? Uh, does it come from your DM25, your new political party or ideological uh, movement? So... We do have to, I think the history's out there, it's accessible to all of us, and we can grab it and make use of it. But we can also have the one that we grew up with, hopefully. But how, how do we do that in a world that changes so quickly, where Amazon is ubiquitous, and products and services just fly around the globe all the time? And, uh, you know, we tend to get our uniqueness bled out of us, which bothers a lot of conservative people. You know, uh, who's going to say what's right and wrong? What's the tradition? You know, what do we believe? What do we think is good? What do we think is evil? Oh, well, we're going to come up with a new one and it's going to be global Star Trek. Everybody's going to agree um, somehow. I don't think so. There's still going to be a lot of tension between those things, a lot of contradictions in there for a long time to come. But I agree with the spirit of, of what Rebecca is saying there completely. So she goes on, In this sense, the Metatribe project is as much about recovery as it is about progression, reviving a vision of communal life, communal responsibility, and communal reverence for the sacred that the atomized modern world has rendered increasingly rare, while still embracing the freedom of technological comfort modernity has made possible. And this is something that I think about all the time. What are you going to give up? What do you want to throw away? You know, you want to throw away modern medicine and use herbs and so on. You want to get rid of vaccines. Um, you know, uh, you want to get rid of the computers. <laughs> 
I don't think so. So it's going to be a balancing act. It's really going to be hard. And there's going to have to be regulation and a lot of struggle. I don't know if we're going to get there. In my mind, in my story that I'm writing, things get pretty, 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 pretty bad. Remember long, long ago, I forget exactly when, our species dwindled down to about five to 10,000 people somewhere in Africa for many reasons. And we almost died out back then, but somehow we survived. And then we, we spread all across the globe. Imagine that, generation after generation, going across the, whatever they called it, the Alaska Bridge, <laughs> whatever they called it, whatever they call it, the academics, the scientists, all the way down to the tip of South America. And, you know, all these, the Denovians and Neanderthals and Homo sapiens and all this DNA that we can see now, we get more and more data every day from 23andMe and other companies like that to understand our, our evolution, our DNA, groups of people around the world. How different are you really as a Japanese and a Chinese and a Mongolian, genetically speaking, and so on, and culturally speaking and whatnot, you know? And we're, we're, we're still all Homo sapiens, right? But it's fascinating. And more data every day. We're going to learn more and more. If we survive, if we progress, if we keep going, we're going to learn more and more. But we're going to need some grounding. We're going to need some tradition. We're going to need some community. We're going to need to make peace all the time, 24-7. Jesus Christ. You know, we're going to have to make peace because we can't do it. We won't have time if we're making war. I guarantee that. I promise you that. And it's a waste. You think you're so damn smart that you have to live forever? So who are you going to sacrifice in Ukraine or some other war to keep the neoliberals happy, to keep the corporations profitable, to keep the shareholders happy? I mean, these kind of markets have to be destroyed and some other new kinds of markets have to be invented before we get there. But the people who run the show, it's very, very good to them. You know, baseball been very, very good to me. A Saturday Night Live skit. You know, why would we want to change it? What we want to do is keep it going and keep it working. And, you know, it's just like, uh, did Roosevelt save capitalism? <laughs> you know, from the mob, from the revolutionaries. Got to make capitalism palatable to the plebs and proles. Just keep them happy so nothing gets too crazy. And, uh, you know, all those jobs you're losing, it's not a problem because you don't need those jobs anyway. Other things are coming along and so on and so forth. It's all going to be very meaningful. I have my ideas about how that's going to work out. And I'm writing a story about it. But who knows, Right. So, yeah, who needs a legal assistant? We, we have AIs now. The, the legal assistant does something else. They write algorithms or the, they, they put prompts into AIs or they make ukuleles. Uh, they knit sweaters, whatever. And, and they're people. They have value. The robots, the AIs that we create today... We programmed them to treat us like cute little pets and to make sure we survive. So, yes, you cute little pets, you get out there and you take care of the water table and the soil biology and make your beautiful gardens and dance your beautiful dances, and make your beautiful music and make love and make families and all that kind of stuff. And we'll look after you. We'll watch out for you. We'll make sure that you understand uh, what you're doing right and wrong and how you can correct for any mistakes you're making. Instead of that uh, oral wisdom being passed on generation to generation, you'll just go to the oracle, and it'll tell you what's, what's happening. Will you trust it? How do we build trust? All the IFAs in the world, international financial advisors, relationships built on trust. Trust me, dude, this, this mutual fund's going to sort you out, your retirement, whatnot. It's all good. You trust me. Let's have a drink. 
Let's talk about your kid's soccer match. Let me sell you some insurance. So to discover the laws of magic and become. Vogel puts it, the reason that history feels both out of control and stagnant is because we're alienated from it. Our spirits can't actively participate in it. We constantly engage with it in terms of geopolitics or trying to build the right kind of AI or design the right kind of society. We're like, can we figure out the formula for making people into great founders? And this, I love this. This, this I resonate with this so much because this is the thing, right? Everybody has to be validated. Everybody has to be in a serial entrepreneur and a founder of this and that. And we're all running in a million different directions. Everybody's a leader. Leadership's important. Everybody gets an award. The fact is life's brutally competitive and some people are going to win and a lot of people are going to lose. So what do we do to maintain the integrity of society and life on earth, ecology and so on? and people's mental and physical health, knowing that not everyone's going to be a winner in the sense that we look at certain kinds of people who are much more gifted than we are and come from better circumstances and so on. But anyhow, uh, you know, basically, can you give the people health at least? even though they, they don't look like you or they're a different race, quote unquote, scare quotes, or they come from south of the border. Health for my people, not for them. I see this all the time. So Lee Labresco Sargent, another one. I think religion is very powerful, and it's interesting that religious people have greater life satisfaction. So should I try doing religion so should I try doing religion like it's recreational drugs to see where it takes me? That's an interesting point. First of all, religious people have better life satisfaction is not actually true. It depends on how you do the research and look at the meta research and so on. There's a lot of literature on this, but it's a, it's a constant theme in the religious magazines and newspapers and literature that you're going to be happier if you're religious. Well, if you're not sincerely religious, then you're just going through the motions. Maybe it helps a little bit, but, you know, yeah, it gives you some structure to your life. But, yeah, recreational drugs. You know, I tried this religion. I, you, I met, I've done it myself, and I've met many people that did. You try on this one, try on that one, see if it works, see how you feel about it. And and then decide it's not for you. Namyoho Renge Kyo is not for me. You know, I'm going to go do something else. Nichiren Daishonin. You know, or going to India. I went to India when I was, you know, 19 or whatever, wandered around. Um, it's not what I thought. <laughs> it was interesting, though. So anyhow, religion, meditation, magic, occultism, shadow work, all these in the Metatribe model are mere avenues for self-development and self-transcendence. Well, I got to transcend myself somehow. I, I probably do that when I die. I think of the Tibetan Book of the Dead, and honestly, I want to, when I'm dying, I want to have happy thoughts and comfort and kind of feeling like it's okay. It's my time. And and go with happy memories in my head peacefully. I don't want to be struggling. I don't want to be screaming for my mommy and guilt-ridden and all that. I think that kind of mental, emotional, spiritual, intellectual uh, hygiene is what gives you a happy death. I love that book, A Happy Death by Albert Camus. But transcending myself, I don't think I'm going to be able to do that. I could say I'm, I did it. I could tell you I'm enlightened and tell you why and how and follow me, but uh, I don't know if that's true. I don't know if I can. I don't know if you can, but that's up to you to decide. Cast a love spell. Go to church. Attend a five rhythms ecstatic dance class. Take psychedelic mushrooms. All of these functionally amount to the same thing, an injection of what foundational post 
Strat writer David Chapman calls meaningness. Meaningness. Meaningness, Chapman writes on his website, entails that meaning is real but not definite. It is neither objective nor subjective. It is neither given by an external force nor a human invention. Well, meaning's a word, and meta-meaning, or thinking about meaning, is is very human thing. It's kind of like a human invention. I don't know about whales or crustaceans or octopi. <laughs> where do we go? Where where they're getting their meaning? But anyhow, it's not an external force. Well, what's external? Is uh, is your is the way your nervous system and endocrine system and brain and body and microbiome and you know uh, muscles and sinew and bones interact with the world over time and what acts upon you all the time and isn't this all a human invention in a way but we have meaningness objective subjective i mean that it all kind of goes together in a in a way but we 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 need to parse it we need to understand the differences but it's not a machine and it's not something we invented of course not we are what we are we're human beings i don't know that's that's an interesting thing i'm not all there with it he says taking from the eternalist stance the commitment that human beings do and indeed should experience the world as a locus of meaning and from the nihilist stance the reaction that there is a single eternal source of meaning behind it okay um i don't know i really you know god or whatever created the universe or however the universe came into being or whatever the the physics the quantum mechanics behind it the metaphysics i don't know e eternal source of meaning what's eternal can we contemplate infinity what is eternity does eternity have a beginning anyway an origin, a beginning? I, I don't know. I can't go there. I know the philosophy. We could talk, go to somebody else to, to talk about all that kind of stuff. But in my mind, I, I don't see it or care to see it in those terms. I don't need to see it in those terms. I don't need the eternal source of meaning. And if God's extremely abstract in my mind and I can't touch God, I can't comprehend it, if I can't do the quantum physics, it doesn't bother me at all because I still have all the emotions and sensations and thoughts and relationships in my life and they're, they're profound sometimes. And I, I love it and I feel fortunate. I guess because maybe I'm kind of healthy in my mind, relatively speaking. And that's lucky me, you know? Thank you, thank you very much whoever I'm thanking, whatever I'm thanking, the whole thing. So there's no one true ritual order that's going to survive forever. Yep, that's true. The best hope is maybe there are ritual micronutrients or vitamins that we can discover and then figure out how to supply them under different technological regimes. Spirituality exists not in itself but for us. Yeah, so if you're not transcendental, if you don't believe in in God in a certain way, you're inventing it for you. You know, I gotta have the micronutrients and the technology and the algorithms and the in the smartphone and the implant in the in the computer that I'm that's gonna scan my nervous system and my memories and all that crap. Come on, man, let it all go. It can be so much more simple, and. Using technology for simpler things would probably be a really good thing, I think. Yeah, spirituality exists not in itself, but for us. So we, we have to invent all those things, inject it. Who's going to do it? Who's watching the watchers? Who's watching the AIs? Who's inventing them? 
what do they do? What are their purpose? Are they just freewheeling out there with all of our data coming up with shit? And if, if, if it does do things to us psychologically and emotionally and sociologically that are not good, why did we allow that to happen? And how do you inject? Who's spir spirituality? That's why all these traditionalists and Eurasianists and Alexander Dugan and people are talking about, no, man, leave us alone. We want to live our life with a, in, within the envelope of how we see the universe and, and meaning and the information in our universe. And just let us live and let live. Just let us be, okay? We can trade. We can share. But uh, leave us alone. Let us have our own thing. And then somebody has to decide what that thing is, right? The Pope in Rome decides for the Catholics. And then you have all the people that don't think it's a real Pope. That never goes away. And maybe Star Trek just isn't in our future. Maybe extinction is, but whatever. We're alive now, so we're going to play with all this stuff. And hopefully it's going to make us famous. Some of us, anyway, while well, the rest of us struggle to get along and worry about being made to eat crickets and bugs. I think we can have um, an omnivorous diet. We can have fish and, and things. But we have to take care of the oceans and the lakes and the rivers. If we're going to have, if we're going to eat fish. <laughs> and if not, at some point, we're going to have to come up with soil and green or something else because. We won't have anything to eat, folks. Wet bulb earth comes along and water tables disappear and desertification happens and, you know, you're growing champagne grapes in, in Wales instead of France and <laughs> things shift around and people start to starve. And when it hits the rich people, then they do something about it. Uh, what happens in Somalia, in Yemen, who gives a fuck? Later on, we... Clinton looks back and says, maybe we should have done something in, in Bosnia. Uh, so let's definitely bomb the Serbs. You know, we got to intervene or not intervene. I don't know what to do. And mostly we're going to intervene if there's, you know, rare earths there or cobalt or copper or oil. But we're not going to intervene just because people are slaughtering each other. <laughs> That's their business. So it's spirituality for the secular age, anchored by the conviction that reality is downstream of our personal psychological power. If there's a doctrine underpinning both rationalist and post-rationalist thought, it is the quintessential liberal faith in human potential. And you know, I believe in human potential in the sense that I believe that there is a kind of a a top tier of human potential that people can achieve if they're born in the, into the right circumstances, if their mother and their grandmother and their grandpappy and great-grandpappy were well-fed and taken care of and loved, and that passes on through the generations, and it gets to you, and you get to be educated and, and learn, and you get loved and nurtured, and you're part of a good, healthy community in a healthy world eating healthy food and so on, and you can reach your potential, whether you're a musician or a thinker or a writer or a craftsperson or a business person or whatever. And so you can get there. There is human potential, and a lot of human potential, in my point of view, in my opinion, is wasted. It's not being used. It's not being tapped into. It's destroyed. We have this war in Ukraine. All that human potential is wrecked. And this goes on for generations. So while you're not concerned about making peace and diplomacy, and it's all Putler's fault and all that, think about all the things we could have done leading up to this that would have prevented it. There are so many things. And if you can't see that, can't look at the second and third order effects of things, and you can't do, you know, revisionist history. You can't think around things in a critical way. And you don't, you only want to see things in narrow good versus evil ways. Then you're, forget it. You have no opinion. It's a tragedy what's happening. It's a total waste. And the idea that 
the corporations are going to come in and build a better, stronger, more resilient Ukraine after this devastating war is over is ridiculous. It didn't have to happen. And there are better ways to develop a country than destroying it. Vietnam, we had to destroy the village to save it. McNamara, is he a genius, game theoretic dude, player, or is he a freaking lunatic? And sometimes I think, I'm sane, and all these other players, these smart asses, are freaking lunatics. They're not healthy, they're sick, they're psychopathic. And I don't have to look back at them and say, just because they were the Secretary of State or they were had a degree or whatever, that they're great people. They're destructive. They're venal, greedy, hateful, odious people. They really are. And they may not see it that way. And the other players may not see it that way. But I get that feeling because it's avoidable, this crap. We shouldn't be spending money on weapons. I'm talking about the world here. We should be spending money on carbon sequestration and, and new energy that's more sustainable and, and stewarding the earth so that it's healthy and all these other things we could be doing. And if you say, well, it's human nature. No, it's not human nature. We don't just go there. We have to say this is the system and it's structured in a certain way. And finance is structured and the economy is structured and the philosophies behind it and so on and so forth. They need to change. So all these clever people on all these clever blogs better start thinking about that, how to do that at scale. Otherwise, it is a kind of masturbation. And it's very exciting for us to talk about it, but nothing's happening. You have to go to your leaders, you have to go to the players and say, look, it's up to you. You've got the power, man. When you get to your Bilderberg thing, can you think about this stuff? You're going to have to shift your game uh, because this particular one is unsustainable. It's going to kill us all. And it is killing. It's just an omnicidal heat engine, a horrific killing machine. <laughs> the, the sixth extinction is a real thing, people. And the Anthropocene, however you want to define it, is a, is a thing. And nuclear uh, arms is a thing. And climate change, global warming, uh, forever chemicals, plastic waste, it's a thing. Recycling is a thing. Energy is a thing. These are real. These are challenges. These are important. These are the things we should be investing in. And we should be investing in our communities, our relationships, our families, our intellect, our bodies, our health, all of that stuff. And a lot of people are doing it. There's a lot of good leadership out there to help us. And we need to be aware of them, pay attention to them. And then we have to do it in our own lives, in our own space and time, because we're running out of time. Things have accelerated. And you can look at the Consilience Project and other things like that and see how... Uh, these intelligent people are thinking about these problems. But we need some radical change, unfortunately. And yeah, maybe the radical change is go going to a more trad-esque kind of a structure, situation. But how are we going to develop the kings, the benevolent leaders, and their elite, so that they can take care of things and make things more healthy? and sustainable or what what are they going to be in it for so i want to ask curtis yarvin who who's that guy please don't tell me it's musk please don't tell me it's the governor of ohio for fuck's sake anything in this system can't transcend this system and become a benevolent king that's going to sort shit out and even even if it's like uh, you know the zeitgeist movement or whatever. Well, maybe Ecuador will do it or something. Or Bitcoin's going to solve the problem. No, it's not. It's, it's, uh, it's much more difficult. So somehow you've got to be able to penetrate across cultures, understanding the differences in emotional expression, in intellectual expression, tradition, background, education, 
worldview, outlook, all these things, and, and bridge the gap and talk about these things that we have in common, these human things, these global issues. And we have to change the economy while we're doing that, which means we have to decide how many things we need, how many phones we need, how many cars we need, you know, how many fast food chains do we need? How much fast fashion do we need? You know, life cycle assessment, total life cycle assessment, and also the history of stuff. Nobody pays any attention to this shit because we want hypernormal stimuli all the time. We want to be, we want to be titillated. We want the likes, the validation. We want the dopamine hits. And, you know, endocrinology and all this stuff, it's very complex. It's not as simple as testosterone makes you angry or violent. No, 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 no. It can make you Jesus. <laughs> it depends on the context. And it depends on status. And it depends on what you value and what you're going to get patted on the back for. You could get a lot of testosterone hits just by being patted on the back for being a loving human being that contributes to your community. And it's worth more than money, trust me. So both camps evince a profound faith in what we might call human godliness. The idea that we are not only the recipients of the world around us, but also its creators. Going back to my childhood, we're here to create God. Well, we have ideas about God and meaning and all this stuff. We put them forth and we build things around it, structures and institutions and cultures and whatnot, tribes. We have our traditions, our history. It's very complex nowadays. Um, and we do create. We're, we are homo makers. We make shit. Pretty damn good at it. We're not sapiens. We're not wise, and we need to be more wise. All of this is true. So schools in which it is difficult to distinguish the human power to shape and persuade from the outright supernatural. Well, supernatural, whatever that is, it's super, and it's beyond nature, so I can't do much about it. I can talk about how I access it and be very poetic and be cool and be a guru and, you know, maybe get some attention. Yudowski is clear that part of the appeal, uh, sorry, Yudowski is clear that part of the appeal of rationality is the promise of self-overcoming, of becoming more than merely human. Wow. More than merely human. Not good enough to be human, people. We have to be Marvel comic heroes. I mean, we listen to the stories around the campfire of the heroes. We imagine it and we feel it and we play it in our minds. And, and that's the thing, the human thing. But we can't all be that. You're not ever going to be a god, no matter what. And however you define it. We are humans. We're not merely humans. We're, we should be proudly human. We should be crying at how beautifully human we are. We should shed happy tears. We should be touched, beautifully touched. <laughs> you know, how human we are. And when we're healthy humans, we're not so dangerous and violent. And we're beautiful creatures with the potential to do so much for life on Earth and potentially even in the universe someday. But we need time. We got to slow down. We got to be patient. But we're not going to be patient if it's profits first, hashtag profits first mentality, you know, quarterly profits, capital on capital returns, financialization, derivatives. I, we're never going to get there if that's where we're at. <laughs> We're never going to get there. The tragedy of the commons, the multipolar traps, externalities, consequences, all of these things are going to bury us. 
And it's going to be a pretty miserable death. And when we die, it's, going, it's not going to be that happy death that I'm talking about I want to have. It's going to be a horror story. And I think hell is the eternity in your brain just before you shut off. And all the horror of the universe that you lived in is right there in your face for an eternal split second. That's hell. So Harry, we learn, wants to discover the laws of magic and become a god. Yet it is rationality in the end that gives Harry the godlike powers of understanding and shaping his world. A world that Yudowski tells us, sorry, Yudkowski, I'm sorry I butchered your name the whole time. Yudkowski tells us, will one day be one in which the descendants of humanity have spread from star to star and won't tell the children about the history of the ancient earth until they're old enough to bear it. And when they learn, they'll weep to hear that such a thing as death had ever once existed. Well, I don't think so. <laughs> so the machines that are running around, maintaining the machines that are going around the universe, uh, it's like that Greek thing I was talking about. Uh, is it the same thing after it's been updated? You know, security update, patch, new algorithms, new new applications, new equipment, new material technology, new nanotubes, <laughs> everything. You know, oh, is it the same thing? I don't know. It's a different thing. So whatever. And death never existed. Life and death go hand in hand. If you're talking life, you're talking death. Otherwise, you're talking something else. How long is our star going to last? When our star supernovas, what is it after that? A cloud of what? Where does the energy go? Thermodynamics, entropy. Where does it go? What is it? Carl Sagan's star stuff. Dark matter, dark energy. God, mystery, emptiness, space, the void, infinity. Now, oh, come on. These mysteries are going to be there forever. We're never going to solve all of them. It's stupid. Why get ahead of ourselves? We can do the science. We can make things. We can learn. We can grow. We can, we can get everyone on the planet to a certain level of health and vitality and intelligence and we can make peace, people, and give ourselves some time to be beautifully human. Beautifully human. So concluding, the Metatribe may have different, well, methods, but their goal, too, is self-transcendence. As Vogel told me, both Nietzscheism and the occult discourse of the hermeticism, even, and even mod modern rationality, a thread through all of these things is the implicit desire to become God. <clears throat> well, you create your children, to, you, you influence and are part and parcel of your communities, you can invent, you can create, but you're not God. Whatever the hell that is, you define it. And you don't have to be God to be beautiful. You don't have to be a big success to be beautiful. You don't have to be the smart guy on the interwebs to be the smartest guy on the interwebs to be beautiful. You don't have to have a new kind of mathematics that's better than all the other kinds of mathematics, but you're misunderstood because the status quo doesn't want to recognize your genius to be beautiful. Look at the simple people I've known around the world and how beautiful, loving, and kind they were. 